Today on Cook's Country, Brian and Julia make a foolproof version of a Brooklyn classic, prosciutto bread. Jack challenges Bridget to a tasting of provolone, and Ashley makes Bridget the ultimate drop meatballs. That's all right here on Cook's Country. Lard bread from southern Italy is a rustic loaf with rendered pork fat and small pieces of cracklings worked into the simple dough. Oh, sounds so good. Now, it was not only a clever way to use up kitchen scraps, but the extra fat added flavor and made the crust super crisp. Immigrants brought the bread with them in the early 1900s and tinkered with the recipe, swapping cured meats for cracklings, using olive oil instead of lard, and adding a little cheese. It just gets better and better. <laughs> Well, it's also known as prosciutto bread today, and it's still made all over Brooklyn, home to several family-owned businesses that have been making this bread for generations. And today, we're bringing the bread to you. Let's head into the kitchen with Brian. Unless you live in Brooklyn, you're probably gonna need a little bit more of a description of what prosciutto bread or lard bread is. And since Brian here grew up eating this stuff, he's gonna tell us. That's right. I remember very specifically when I was 12 years old, Walking down the street with my brother and my uncle. My uncle was ripping off hunks of bread filled with meat <laughs> of some kind. And I remember thinking it was the most delicious thing I ever had. <laughs> but I remember it like it was yesterday. The next day I asked him, what was that bread that we were eating? He's like, I don't, I don't remember what you're talking about. <laughs> so it went on like that for the next 30 years. Nobody knew this bread that I was talking about. I didn't have a name for it. Eventually I met a woman from Brooklyn. She said, you know what you have to try when you come to New York is prosciutto bread. I said, does that have chunks of meat in it? And she said, yes, it does. We're going to start off with the star of the show, and that's prosciutto. That's Pr some thick prosciutto. Yes. You want to go to the deli counter and ask them to cut some big slabs. These are quarter-inch slabs of prosciutto. You never find this otherwise pre-cut in the deli case. That's right. So we're going to cut this into half-inch pieces. So prosciutto goes into a bowl. And now the prosciutto's got a few sidekicks. One of them is capicola and the other one is pepperoni. A lot of different bakeries in, in Brooklyn do with different types of meat, salamis, things like that. These are just the three that we settled on, but they could be mixed and matched however you see fit. Well, it's probably a good way in a bakery or a deli to use up the ends of the meat. You've yes. got to cut them into chunks and throw them in a bread. And that's kind of how it was originally developed, exactly. throwing up the odds and ends. So this is sweet capicola. You could use hot if you wanted to, if you like the bread a little bit spicier. Finally, we have three ounces of pepperoni. So we had three ounces of prosciutto, three ounces of capicola, and three ounces of pepperoni. Now, some versions also contain cheese. This is five ounces of quarter-inch thick sliced provolone. And again, we'll just cut it in the same half-inch sized pieces that we did with the meats. So let's make the dough. We have three cups of bread flour in mm -hmm. the mixer already. To that, we're going to add one and a half teaspoons of instant yeast and one teaspoon of table salt. I'm just gonna whisk that together to combine it. And to that, we're gonna add six ounces of a mild lager, and it's room temperature, because we wanna allow the yeast to start working as soon as possible. We have six tablespoons of room temperature water. Add that there. And then we have three tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil. Usually, you have to let the bread ferment to get that nice yeasty flavor, mm -hmm. and this speeds it up. So we're going to turn the mixer on low, slowly add this beer mixture. We'll let this mix for about two minutes until the dough just starts to come together. Okay, so now that the flour is fully hydrated and we have a basic dough in there, we're gonna turn it up to medium speed and let it go for about eight minutes to really knead the dough and develop the gluten. Okay, it's been eight minutes. We'll take a look at the dough. That is a solid looking dough right there. Nice and chewy, a lot of gluten developed. So now we're gonna add all of our meats and cheese as well as a good kick of black pepper. That's one of the characteristics of this bread is a heavy hand with the black pepper. So all this right. is one and a half teaspoons of the black pepper. And we're gonna let this mix for about two minutes on low speed until it just starts to come together. However, at that point, not all the meat and cheese will be worked into the bread. We'll have to do a little bit of counter work. Gotcha. That dough has some Brooklyn attitude, that's for sure. <laughs> Both the dough and the meat, they don't want right. to combine so easily. No. All right, so we're going to knead it for a little bit to incorporate the meat and the cheese a little bit better. So we're going to hit it on a lightly floured counter. That's so. a lot of meat and cheese you're trying to put into that dough. Yep. It's okay. <laughs> it's force feeding it. <laughs> all right, so just knead it until you can get all the meat and cheese to stick to it. So I'm just kind of folding it over and pressing it with my hand a quarter turn every time and then push anything else into it. I don't think I've ever seen a bread so stuffed with things. I love it. 
All right, so that's most of it incorporated. We're just going to shape it into a ball here. We're going to transfer it to a lightly greased bowl. Okay, and then we're going to cover it with a little bit of plastic wrap. And we're going to let this dough rise at room temperature until it's doubled in size. And that takes about one and a half hours. Okay, Julia, you can see that the dough is doubled in size. Mm -hmm. It's only taken us about an hour and a half to get there. So we're going to divide this dough in half because it makes two loaves of bread. In order to get it perfect, I'm going to weigh the dough and then split it in half. We're looking at about 21 ounces per loaf. All right. So you're going to shape one loaf. All right. If you don't mind. I don't mind. OK. So we want to shape these into baguette style, mm -hmm. about 12 inch logs. And in order to do that, we want to press them out to knock out any of the air. And we were looking for an eight by five inch rectangle. All right, I'm gonna borrow your ruler. Let's see, eight by five, all right. I am there too. So the shaping goes like this. We're going to take the top edge of the dough and mm -hmm. fold it down to the midline. Okay. Just press it in there. Now, so I see a lot of these meats and cheeses are wanting to pop out. Just poke them back in. That means it's working. <laughs> It's perfect. Now we're going to take the bottom edge of our rectangle and fold it up to the midline. It's not a massive fold, but this little technique here helps reduce any odd rising in the dough. You know? So it can get a nice even loaf out of the oven. Exactly. It kind of prevents the air pockets from forming. Okay, so now we've pinched that in there mm -hmm. to seal it. And we want to flip the dough over. Okay. And we're just going to give it a light roll so we get a 12 inch log. And it's basically already there. And then on the ends, you want to just taper off the ends a little bit. Okay. Perfect. All right. Okay, so we're going to transfer them to a rim baking sheet. I'm going to dust the sheet with a little bit of cornmeal. The cornmeal will help keep the dough from sticking to the sheet. And it'll also help give a nice crunchy bottom to our loaves. Mm. Okay. So I'm going to throw mine on there first. We're going to let these rise until they're slightly puffy, which takes about 45 minutes at room temperature. And you notice we gave ample room in between the loaves, mm -hmm. about three inches, uh, so when they expand, they don't touch each other, okay? No touching. So we're going to cover this with greased plastic wrap and let it sit for about 45 minutes. All right. Okay, Julia, it's been about 45 minutes, and you can see that the dough is nice and puffy. Poke it, it just springs back very slowly. Mm -hmm. And before we go into the oven, we're going to give it a vertical slash down the length of it, starting at about one and a half inches from each end and going about a half inch deep. And this helps it expand a little bit as it's in the oven. Okay, so now we're ready to throw this into a 450 degree oven right under the middle rack. And we're going to let it cook until it hits about 205 degrees. That takes about 25 minutes. Not too long. You can smell it, huh? Oh, that smells good. All right, so internally these should be somewhere between 205 and 210 degrees, so. Which is the general temperature you want to bake all your breads to, to make sure they're baked all the way through. So we're going to let these cool on the wire rack mm -hmm. for about three hours and come back and tear into them. All right. It's been a painful three hours, but we <laughs> could finally tear into this. And in the style of Brooklyn, we're going to uh, rip you off a hunk here. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh, oh that's for you. Thank you. It is like a sandwich inside. Boy, I could really smell that pepper. Yeah. Mmm. Mm-hmm. That's been 30 years mm -hmm. in the making. The long oh. lost bread of my childhood. I love the little bit of beer in there. You don't taste beer, but it just adds a fermented bread flavor. It's really hard to get with such a quick rise as we had with this bread. And each of the meats, they all taste different. So you get like a little pepperoni pocket. And over here I have a little prosciutto pocket. Oh, I like this. I wanted to get to the soft, oh, the inside. That pillowy inside. Fluffy but chewy. This bread is great if you're low carb too. <laughs> Because it's, it's half meat. That's <laughs> true. Ryan, this is incredible. Thank you. So if you want to make this incredible Brooklyn-style bread, start by cutting prosciutto, pepperoni, capicola, and provolone into half-inch pieces. Using bread flour, water, beer, and olive oil, make a simple dough in a stand mixer, then knead in the meats and cheeses and let it rise for one and a half hours. Shape the dough into two long loaves and let it rise again before slashing the top and baking in a hot oven for 25 minutes. From Cook's Country, Brian's famous prosciutto bread with provolone. This is killer bread. Thanks. I'm loving this. Me too. The original 
grilled cheese that turned a steak and onion sandwich into Philly's beloved cheesesteak. It's provolone, and today we're asking Jack which American sliced provolone won our tasting. I have some amazing cheeses for you to taste, but first I want to do a little history lesson. Okay. So we're going to go, we're in the North End in Boston, or maybe we're in Florence in an Italian market. Same thing, right? Yeah, <laughs> and there's beautiful cheeses tied with ropes, bell-shaped, hanging from the ceiling along with the prosciutto. That is provolone. That's real provolone. Yeah, we're not actually tasting that today. Oh, great, thanks. But I thought I should at least show you it. So this is what we're tasting. Okay. Sliced, the slice. deli style, made in America provolone that can go in a sandwich, can go inside a stromboli. Mm. If you are in Italy, or maybe if you're in the North End here in Boston or Little Italy, anywhere in the US, you will see this is a dolce. So this is aged up to four months. This is a picante, hmm. aged up to three years. So uh, it's not actually sweet. No, it is not sweet. It is sweet compared to the sort of very funky sharp. sharp. This is really a table cheese. Mm -hmm. This is the dolce is similar to what you're going to be tasting today, but it's aged a bit longer. These are basically aged two weeks to two months as opposed to the dolce that might be up to four months. So you could start tasting. Okay. All provolone is a cow's milk cheese. It is made in the same process as mozzarella. The curds are, they're kneaded. One thing that was very different is enzymes are added. And so when they make the dolce, they use a enzyme that is from um, calf's milk. Uh, when they make the picante, it is from goat, which gives it a much funkier flavor. Tangy. The American cheeses, they're usually using vegetable-based enzymes so that the cheese is still vegetarian. Gotcha. Yeah, so we did two more tests. The next test we did, we made these beautiful stromboli, where was I that day? Yeah, you were not here. And we actually felt like it was too difficult to taste because with the salami and the bread and everything else, this is a mild cheese. It doesn't have a lot of personality. And so we then did simple quesadillas. Oh okay, all right. So the thing you're looking for is the salt level varies a little bit here. I wouldn't say they're really any bad cheeses. They have some slightly different personalities. Some of them have a little bit of smoke flavor mm -hmm. that you might or might not detect. We didn't really have a feeling whether that was a positive or a negative. It's just some people thought mm, that has a little smokiness to it mm -hmm. and that actually is something that they're adding. Um, you're really looking for butteriness, nuttiness, milkiness. Yeah, all of these would be absolutely suitable. This one to me is definitely the mildest. And is that a good thing? Not necessarily. I like my cheese to taste like something followed by that and this is i love that but i have a feeling that's just from a world away from these that's my favorite this is my next favorite these two are are the mildest this actually has some flavor it's a little bit saltier okay all right so <laughs> i'm gonna keep eating them though. so are you are, 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 are we are we making a final decision yes yes favorite number two all right well let's start with your favorite all right so, you chose the Italian dolce cheese. You know, I love the texture of it. It's granular, it's, been, it's drier, it's really flavorful. Do you think sometimes I am nicer to the audience than I am to you? Actually, they didn't get this cheese. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> It's good to be the host. <laughs> well, I wanted to make the point that, first of all, you can use this cheese as a melting cheese inside a stromboli. I mm -hmm. mean, I, you wouldn't want to do that with the picante because it's a really very different cheese. Sure. But this is actually a cheese that you could put on a board mm -hmm. with some apples or apricots. Um, and a nice bottle of wine. I'm not sure the rest of these cheeses would really merit going onto a cheese board. It'd be the deli plate instead yeah. of the cheese board. All right, I'm gonna go for my second place. So you chose Sargento. We liked all of the mm -hmm. deli cheeses fine. It's a little smoky. This is one that has some smoky flavor. I kinda like that. This was the least favorite oh. of the, the studio audience. It reminded me of smoked Gouda, which yeah. I absolutely love. Yeah. So I probably shouldn't have picked it for this. Well, but. the expert panel recommended all of them. Okay. I mean, we felt like they were differences, but no, none of them were significantly better or worse than the rest. It's, even though there are all these different options, there aren't that many options. When Jack's not here, he's working at the union as a diplomat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go for this one. So that was the expert panel, Organic Valley. That was their top choice. Mm -hmm. The second choice for um, uh -huh. the studio audience. You're right here? Yeah, they liked the Galbani. That was the favorite here. Just eked out a win within the uh, studio audience. Interesting. We're all so different, aren't we? We are different. <laughs> well, there you go. There are no losers, but if you want to pick up the winning brand of our tasting, it's Organic Valley Provolone Cheese Slices. It runs six eighty nine dollars for six ounces. <laughs> For 
For years, we've told you that great tasting meatballs always start with browning. It might be on the stovetop or in the oven. But a recent trip to South Philly had us rethinking everything we knew about meatballs. And speaking of meatballs, Ashley's <laughs> here. She's going to tell us what we found. What did we find? Well, we found that you can make drop meatballs and get just as good of a result as if you made them the traditional way, the browning way. So no browning. No browning. Now we're going to use just ground beef for this meatball. We're going to start by making what's called a panade. Now, as you know, panades are used for things like meatballs or for meatloaf. Mm -hmm. And it's when you want to make sure something stays tender during cooking and retain its shape. So usually we use fresh bread crumbs or panko bread crumbs, but today we're gonna to be using saltines. And the main reason for that is because we found that there was less moisture in the saltines and it made the meatballs less gummy. Okay, so right. we don't want gummy, we don't want soggy, but we also don't want fragile. Exactly. So this is gonna help with that. Yes, okay. this is 22 square saltines. So I'm going to crush the saltines with this rolling pin. I am gonna get them nice and fine. I don't wanna get them too coarse because I don't know about you, but I don't wanna eat a meatball with a big chunk of saltine in the center right. of it. All right, this will yield about a cup. And I'm just gonna transfer these finely crushed saltines to this bowl. And then for the milk portion, this is one cup of whole milk. I'm just gonna add this in here. And then I'm gonna let them sit for about five minutes until the saltines have had a chance to soften. All right, so using this fork, I'm just going to mash it all in until a nice smooth paste forms. That looks good enough. All right, and now the meat. So this is two pounds of 85% ground beef. And then we have two ounces of grated Parmesan cheese, one teaspoon of dried oregano, one teaspoon of garlic powder, one teaspoon of salt, and a half a teaspoon of pepper. I'm using my hands, I'm gonna get in there. <laughs> You don't want to work it too much because if you do naturally the ground beef it will get tough so just until everything is nice and thoroughly combined we're going to need 24 scant quarter cup meatballs i like to do my first meatball being precise and using the actual measuring cup because that way i can gauge what the rest of the meatballs need to look like in regards to size okay. so now just using my hands again not handling it too much we're going to do 24 total so normally we add egg to meatballs when we needed to provide structure. If we were gonna be dropping them into the sauce, we didn't need that structure. Because the hot sauce is going to set it. Yes. So we're gonna finish up these meatballs, put them in the refrigerator, and they can be held for up to 24 hours in advance, which is a great make-ahead option. But if you are gonna store them in the fridge, just be sure to put some plastic wrap on top. All right, so the meatballs are in the fridge. Now it's time to focus on the tomato sauce. This is 10 cloves of garlic. And today I'm just going to be smashing the whole peeled cloves of garlic, just like so. You turn your knife to the side and boom. You're just cracking it a exactly, little bit. Exactly, yep. I'm gonna do this to all 10. That's a lot of garlic, but the reason that this works in this recipe is because Ashley did not mince the garlic. Instead, she's leaving the cloves whole. Every time you cut through garlic, or really any member of the allium family like onions, you're releasing flavor compounds. So the less you cut it, the less you slice and dice and mince it, the less of that strong flavor you're going to get. So this is going to give a buttery, rich, developed, but balanced garlic flavor. So now I have a quarter cup of extra virgin olive oil. I have the 10 smashed peeled garlic cloves, and I'm just gonna set this over low heat. We want the two things to come up to temperature at the same time. That way the garlic won't burn or scorch, which is the worst way to ruin your sauce. And you can't cover it up. That's exactly right. So I'm gonna cook this for 10 minutes, and I'm gonna go in there with some tongs every so often and just make sure the garlic is getting nice and golden brown on both sides. Sounds good. Let's get a look at the garlic. It smells so good. I know. So here is a half a teaspoon of red pepper flakes. I'm gonna keep it on low heat and just add that in there and just cook them for about 30 seconds until you start to smell that crushed red pepper smell. And it really turns a nice, beautiful burnt orange as well. All right, now let's get going with the tomatoes. Here we have two 28 ounce cans of crushed tomatoes. One teaspoon of salt, okay. Now I'm going to add in the meatballs that have been in the refrigerator. The brownless meatballs. The brownless meatballs. Now I'm not dropping them, I am placing them. 
I'm gonna bring these up to a simmer, then I'm gonna cover the pot, bring it on over to the oven, which has been preheating at 400 degrees, and I'm gonna cook them covered for 40 minutes until the meatballs are tender. Mm, smells heavenly, oh <gasps> wow. Now that's what I'm talking about. It's Vesuvius. It is Vesuvius. Oh, it smells so good. Look okay. at that. That's a whole meatball. That is, it's not a broken up mm -mm. piece of a meatball. Just simmering in the sauce yeah. in the oven is the key. In the oven, yeah. Right. So we had the ambient heat of the oven and it cooked together at the same rate. So I am gonna leave those uncovered to cool while we make some pasta. Okay. Now here I have four quarts of water that I brought up to a boil. I'm gonna add a tablespoon of salt, mix it up a little bit there. And then we have a pound of pasta I'm just gonna go in there with some tongs, loosen everybody up a little bit. So now we're gonna cook this for about eight minutes until the pasta is al dente. Sounds good. All right, so I am going to just moisten the pasta with some of the tomato sauce, just a couple spoonfuls. And a lot of people put olive oil on the pasta, which always cracks me up because then that means that the sauce isn't going to stick to your pasta. But I do like to moisten it with the sauce and that will help to ensure that it doesn't stick together. Yeah, it doesn't take a lot of sauce to do that. Mm -mm. All right, I'm gonna add three tablespoons of chopped basil to our sauce here. Good idea to add it at the last minute so you retain that basil freshness. All right, and then I'm just gonna gently stir the basil in, being sure not to disrupt those balls that we worked so hard to keep intact. All right, it's dinner time. And I have to say, I love your proportions here. Thank you. <laughs> it's pasta with sauce and meatballs. Exactly. Right. That garlic is peeking out in there, and it's actually broken down really nicely. Two mm. meatballs sound okay? Yes, yes. Whatever gets the plate to me faster. <laughs> Would you like any cheese? Sure. All right. And this recipe is great for so many reasons, but one of them is because it makes enough for two pounds of pasta. So I only made one pound of pasta today, so that means I get to hang on to the rest of the sauce, freeze it, save it for later. I love it when you build in leftovers. I know. Great idea. All right. I'm gonna have the pasta in a minute, but for now, oh, these are super tender. Mm-hmm. Let me mop this water in. These are unbelievable. Yeah. Great flavor inside, lots of beefy flavor yeah. inside, but I really thought that these were going to just kind of solidify. But they are incredibly tender. This is so bright and fresh. Mm. It still tastes very developed mm -hmm. because the meatballs were cooked in the sauce. So the sauce took on some of that beefy flavor as well. Perfection. Thank you. Thank you. So for super tender meatballs, crush salting crackers and then mash them with milk to make a panade. Mix in ground beef, Parmesan spices and seasonings, divide and roll into 24 meatballs and chill. Cook smashed garlic cloves in olive oil, add crushed tomatoes, and then nestle in those meatballs. Cook them in the oven until tender, stir in basil, and serve with spaghetti. So from Cook's Country, the easiest drop meatballs. Mm. So tender. Thanks for watching Cook's Country from America's Test Kitchen. So what'd you think? Leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make or just say hi. Now you can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. Alligator. <laughs>